This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! This episode of Science Max, experiments at large is all about light and bending light to your will. Huh? Huh? Right? Right? And challenges me to an ever more tricky game of light manipulation. Plus lasers, periscopes, and what does that have to do with light? Cut to animation! Find out on Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. I'm Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna be looking at light. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Just stay. That, that wasn't supposed to happen. I was supposed to press that button, and there were supposed to be all these lasers and special effects, but it didn't. Well, today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're not gonna be doing one experiment. We're gonna be doing a number of small experiments because we are going to do a light manipulation challenge. I'm gonna get an expert, and she's going to challenge me to a game of light manipulation because I am the master of light. Oh. Well, at least the green lights are working. And, okay, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna turn it, I'm just gonna turn it back to normal. Come on, protect it. I'm gonna work on that later. I'm gonna need an expert to help me though. Um, oh, I know, Anne would be really good at this. It really does look kind of weird in here, doesn't it? Oh, uh, well. You okay? Hi. Hi, Phil. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't see what I was doing. Here's your lab coat. Oh. Thank you for coming. Great. Now you're from Let's Talk Science, right? Yes, that's right. All about science education, just like us. Now you're gonna challenge me to a light to manipulation a, game? A light manipulation game. I've been working on a series of challenges since last time we talked. Each awesome. A little more difficult than the last. Well, this is gonna be great, because I am the light manipulation master. Okay, well, we'll see about that. Okay. Challenge number one. Take a seat. Oh, well, that's easy enough. I have written something on the back side of this ball. Okay. And I'm gonna challenge you to read it. Okay, well, I'm ready. I might be able to read it from here. Let's All see. All right. Okay, I see something's written on it, but I can't read what it says. What if you squint? It looks like a couple lines, maybe? I can't quite tell. Any ideas how to solve this challenge, Phil? Um, and I have to be in this chair? Well, you can get out of the chair to set up your solution. Okay. When you read what I've written on the ball, you have to be sitting in the chair. Well, it's light manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, wait a minute, I've got flashlights in case the power goes out, so maybe I can use a flashlight. Haha, -ha. okay, ready? Pew! Um, huh. Doesn't seem to make it any easier to read. Yeah, I got nothing. Did you give up already? No, of course I don't give up. I told you these were gonna be challenging. This is nothing. I will figure this out. Um, I don't know yet. You're gonna have to get creative. I don't know yet, but I will think of something. Okay. Okay, I will be back. Here, hold the flashlight. Not looking, not looking. I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna wait right here. Okay. Have you ever wondered why you end up upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon? It's because of light reflection. Light is made of photons. Let's say that these tennis balls bouncing off this wall are photons of light. Now, when the, when the surface is flat, like a mirror, the photons, they bounce in and straight back out again. But when the surface is curved, the photons don't go straight out, they get reflected. So now, this photon is going over there, and if we had photons on this side, they would go... I don't even know where those ones are coming from. Then, okay, so we got, we got photons on this side that are going that way, and photons on that side that are going this way. So the top becomes the bottom, and the bottom becomes the top, and that's why you look upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon. Okay, cut to animation, cut to animation! A lens works by changing the direction of light, too. Lenses are made out of curved pieces of glass. When the photons of light pass through the glass, the curved surface makes their paths change. 
What was only this big before becomes this big when you see it. Lenses are used in microscopes to see things that are really small, or in telescopes to see things that are very far away. Both times they are making something small appear large. Anne has challenged me to figure out how to see a small object far away, and using a lens is my solution. Check it out, it's a giant magnifying lens, and I'm gonna use it to magnify the ball so that I can see it. Sounds great. All right. I set the lens in front of the ball, which Anne has turned so I can't see what's on it. I add a light. Shine it on the ball so that it's a little bit better illuminated. And then sit in the chair and ask Anne to move it so it's aligned. All right, so bring it to your left. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep going, right about there. Try bringing it closer to the ball. Okay, wait, that makes it, that makes it smaller. Try going, bring the lens away from the ball. Ooh, wait. Try a little bit further. Ooh! Ho, ho, ho. You're ready for me to spin the ball around? Yep. Okay. It says 71! Nicely done. Easy! Solved! Wait, wait, wait. What? That was just the warm up. Oh, yeah? Yep. You ready for challenge number two? Challenge yeah. number two! I've got another ball. Okay. With something else written on it. Wait. Are you coming back? Nope. Huh. But I can't even see you from here. Like, like how am I? Huh. You're gonna have to manipulate the light. I have to see around a corner? I have to see around a corner. All right, I'll think of something. So you remember the tennis balls in the wall, right? Right? Okay, so the tennis balls are photons, what light is made out of, and the wall is a mirror. Now right now, the photons are hitting the mirror and bouncing directly back. But what happens if they come in at an angle? Like this. Aha! Those photons are reflecting off the mirror and going that way, which means if I want to see what's emitting those photons, I can see it from here. The same thing happens when you look in a mirror. Oh, okay, mirror. Whoa. The mirror reflects the photons over here. I can see the tennis ball launcher in the mirror, which means if there was a barrier, whoa, between me and the tennis ball launcher, I can still use a mirror and the photons would reflect off the mirror and it comes straight to me, which is how you can use a mirror to see around a corner. In fact, periscopes work the same way. Let's make a periscope right now. See, hey, it's dark in here. Oh, right, because I'm gonna show you my laser. So the light from my laser bounces off this mirror in a straight line. Ha ha, reflection. We can use the power of reflection to make the light go where we want it to. We're gonna... We're gonna build a periscope. Submarines use periscopes because it's hard to see when you're underwater. A submarine will extend a periscope up above the water. The image up here gets transmitted down here. So someone looking through the periscope underwater can see what's going on up on the surface. And here's what you need to build it. Two cartons of milk, two small hand mirrors, scissors or a craft knife, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same as regular tape, except you use it for science. And remember, if I go too fast, you can always find these instructions on our website. Step one, cut the tops off your milk cartons. Take your mirror and trace out a rectangle as wide as the mirror, then cut it out. Put some science tape on your mirror and stick it in the carton at an angle. Then put a piece of tape on the inside. Then get the other milk carton and do the same thing. Put a mirror on the inside and then stack the milk cartons together. But don't stack them with the, with the holes on the same side. Make sure you stack them with the holes on opposite sides. And here is what's going on inside. You've got your two mirrors and one is angled like that. 
and the other one is angled like this. Light from what you're looking at comes in, hits that first mirror, goes down to that second mirror, and goes to your eye. You can use it to spy on people from below the table. Bing. <laughs> or from around corners. So there you go, your very own periscope using light reflection. Did you know that your TV remote can be a flashlight? It's true. If you have the kind of TV remote with a little bulb on the end of it, then when you press the buttons, the bulb lights up. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute. The bulb did not light up, and I've never seen the bulb of my TV remote light up when I press the buttons. Well, that's because your TV remote works on infrared, which is a kind of light you can't see. But you might be able to see it with a camera. If you have a digital camera or a camera on your phone, ah, now you can see, see? It lights up. And because infrared light works the same way as visible light in that it will bounce off a mirror, here's an experiment you can do at home. Bounce the light off your TV remote off a mirror and turn on and off your television. Check this out. You get a mirror, set it up just right, and then aim the remote at the mirror and it turns off the television. Pretty cool, right? But now, let's max it out. I've got a complex series of mirrors set up here, and I'm gonna bounce the light from the remote all over the room. And here's what that pattern looks like. The light from the remote hits this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, and then this mirror, and then this mirror, and then finally to the television. Isn't that cool? There you go. Maxed out remote light bouncing infrared flashlight. I gotta come up with a better name, but still, it's pretty cool. Oh, all right. Turn off the television and leave the room. I solved Anne's first light challenge, seeing something far away with a lens. It says 71! But now she's moved the ball around a corner, and now I have the solution. Mirror! A mirror will let me see around the corner. Clever. Right? Okay, so all I gotta do is put the mirror in a position sort of like that, I guess, and then I'm gonna sit in the chair. If you could help me adjust that mirror. Um, uh, keep going that way. Keep going, keep going. Yes, yeah, stop. Nice, okay, go ahead and flip the ball around and I will read the message. It is too small. I can't, okay, I've solved this problem though. Okay, flip it around. The lens, I need the lens. So we'll use a mirror and the lens to, good, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm gonna sit in the chair, here in the chair. It is backwards. Oh yeah, a mirror inverts the image, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. That's okay, that's okay, I can solve this. All I need, whoa, other mirror is all I need to solve this problem. So if I take this mirror and I put it here, let's see, um, there it is. It says 42. Nicely done. <laughs> I am done? ready for anything. What do you got planned for the hardest challenge? Are you sure you're ready for this? Totally. I challenge number three. Challenge number three starts now. What? Wait, 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 no, no. This is a light challenge. How am I supposed to do a light challenge if it's dark? Mm, you have to get creative. But it's dark. Well, okay, no problem. I will think of something. I will be back. Okay. Okay, careful. Wood. I'll be Whoa. waiting. <laughs> careful. So you already know about reflection, right? That's when beam of light, say from my laser, reflects off this mirror and bounces in a straight line. But check this out. If I don't use the mirror and I shine the laser against the underside of the water, it also reflects just like a mirror. This is called internal reflection. If I uh, have a stream of water and I put my laser beam 
into the stream, you can see that the laser bounces around inside the stream of water. It's being internally reflected. And the laser isn't going straight anymore. It's following the stream of water down where the water goes. Internal reflection. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how does this affect me in my everyday life? Internal reflection. Who cares? Well, I can tell you why you should care in two words. Fiber optic wires. Three words, fiber optic wires. You see, fiber optics carry information all over the planet. The internet, maybe even your television, travels through fiber optic wires. The good thing is, because of internal reflection, you can bend fiber optic wires any which way or around corners, and the beams of light continue to go straight down inside the wires and get out the other end, making it go where you want it to go. Internal reflection, science. Back to our light challenge. I've seen something small from far away, seen around corners, but now Anne has turned off the lights. But I have a solution. Oh, Anne, oh, Anne, careful. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry, I forgot how dark it was in here. Okay, I figured it out. Okay. Ah, I have a flashlight. No, so all I need no, to no, no, no. Hold on, here. hold on, hold on. What? There's one more rule I didn't tell you. What's the rule? You can't use visible light. How in the world am I going to do this if I can't use visible light? It's a challenge. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. OK, here, I'll hold my flashlight for a second. Ugh. I'm going to make a phone call. OK. I think I know what to do. I'll be back. Okay. I'll be back. Oh, careful. Ah! Oh. Oh, hey, good to see you. Speaking of seeing things, let's talk about the rainbow. All the colors of the spectrum organized in a beautiful pattern. But what are the different colors? I mean, what makes them different? Well, it all has to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. This is visible light. All the colors of the rainbow. And take a look at that little black line that goes up and down there. That's the frequency of the light. Light is a wave. You see the wavelength is a little wider out here on the red side, and it's a little closer together here on the violet side? That's because every color of light has a different length of wave or wave length. And that is what makes them different when we look at them. But if you think that's all there is to the electromagnetic spectrum, then you're mistaken. So what happens over here on the red side? Does it keep going? Yeah, it does. What? Look, we got infrared here, and then we got microwaves. These are the same kind of waves you use in your oven. And then we got radio waves, which are the same kind of waves you use in your radio. They're all part of the same thing as visible light. Huh? Let's take a look at the other end. Remember these short wavelengths over here beside violet? Well, does that keep going? Yeah. If they keep getting shorter, you get ultraviolet, and then x-rays, and then gamma rays. Huh? Pretty amazing. And look, it's all connected. From radio waves to gamma rays to visible light in between, it's all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> How is this staying up? So everything outside of the visible spectrum is invisible, right? Wrong! Ha-ha! <laughs> Bam! Huh? That is an X-ray, a picture we can take using this part of the spectrum. We can use special cameras to see outside of the visible spectrum. Huh? Huh? Right? <laughs> yeah. You get you okay, you got it. Huh? And look at these. These are night vision goggles. They help you see in the dark. They use part of the spectrum called infrared. For those of you keeping score, that's this part of the spectrum right here. Pretty neat, right? I would sell you these, but they're already spoken for. Oh, and here he comes now. Hey, Sal. Hey, how you doing? You got those goggles I ordered? Yeah, go ahead, help yourself. Thanks for putting them aside. Can I put them on my tab? Yeah, no problem. All right, thanks, Sal. Okay, see you later. Nice kid. He's always in a rush, though. Phil? Is that you? Yeah. Do you need the flashlight? I don't. Turn, turn it off. I can totally make my way over to you. 
Oh. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Oh. Right here. Hi. Because I have night vision goggles. Ooh, ch check it out. Oh, cool. Pretty cool, right? That's awesome. So here's the spectrum again, and here's visible light. My night vision goggles use infrared, this part of the spectrum here with wavelengths just a little bit longer than the red we can see. Outside of the visible light spectrum. All right, I would say that's allowed. No visible light, and I will see the next ball. Have you got it set up? Uh, I set it up while you were out. Okay, good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit in the chair and, and see if I can see it. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, I can totally see everything. Can you tell me what the ball says? It says, it says you win! Nicely done! <laughs> so let's recap. This challenge is the same as the last challenge. The light from the ball was magnified by the lens, sent around a corner by reflecting it off a mirror, and flipped back around by using another mirror. But this time, it's dark. So, using infrared light, thanks to my night vision goggles, I was able to see the ball and win the game. The light manipulation challenge is done. Science Max experiments at large. Time to turn the lights back on. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Huh. What did you do back there? Um, I, I guess we blew a fuse or something. Uh-oh. This is Science Max experiments at large. On this episode of Science Max, I'm on a quest to harness the power of lightning. Its balloon-sticking, hoop-levitating, hair-raising power is all thanks to static electricity. Hold on to your grounding rods. There's electricity in the air. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be harnessing the awesome power of lightning! <laughs> How are we harnessing the power of lightning, you ask? With this balloon. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, what's similar between a balloon and lightning? Well, nothing right now. But behold, as I use the power of static electricity and rub the balloon on my head. Because basically, that's how it starts. You see, when I rub this balloon on my head, it's stealing electrons from me, creating a positive charge in my hair and a negative charge in the balloon. And the interesting thing is, you know that things with opposite charges attract each other, right? Something that has a positive charge will attract negative things and vice versa. But anything with a charge will attract anything with a neutral charge. See all these things on the table? They all have a neutral charge, which means they've got equal amounts of positive and negative. Right now, this balloon is building up a big negative charge, which means it will be attracted to all of these things. This can of Science Max Soda it has a neutral charge. The balloon has a negative charge, which means the can will be attracted to the balloon. And this paper is neutrally charged, which means the paper will be attracted to the balloon. And if you hold the negatively charged balloon next to neutrally charged sugar, ha ha, sugar storm. And you probably, wait, I don't want to get sugar in my hair. And you probably know this trick. If you rub a balloon on your head, you can stick it on the wall. Ha ha! But what does any of this have to do with lightning? Well, the same thing is going on with a lightning bolt. The clouds become negatively charged, and that negative charge wants to equalize itself with the ground, which is neutrally charged. And that lightning bolt is the electricity jumping from one place to another. And you can see this yourself. If you rub a balloon on your head and you put it next to something metal, like a doorknob, there'll be a spark. But here's another thing you can do if you don't have a balloon. Which I guess I don't anymore. Rub your feet, if you're wearing socks, on a carpet, and then turn out all the lights and touch a doorknob you might be able to see a spark jump from your finger to the door. That's lightning in a very, very small form. So that's what we want to do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Max out lightning! I think I'm going to go to the Ontario Science Center and ask Heather her advice. She really knows her stuff. I'm going to go see if she's busy right now. 
Come on. I you just, got the portal fixed, though. So. Well, it's not exactly fixed. It's still got a couple bugs that I'm ironing out, but I stopped coming in 10 feet above the floor. Hey. So that's a, a step yeah. in the right direction. Anyway, Heather, <laughs> I've come here because I want to ask your advice on something. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So what I am doing is creating lightning. So this is where I'm at right now. So this is a balloon. I blow up the balloon, and then I rub it on my head, and it creates a static charge, right? right? Yeah. Just like in the lightning bolt between the clouds and the ground. And the ground. So I was wondering if I was wondering if you could help me maybe max that out and I thought the perfect place to start would be a larger balloon. Ooh, right on. Actually, yeah, I like this. Yeah. Um, I've got a big balloon if you just give me a second. Sure. All right, catch. Okay. All right, giant balloon. So, what I figured is I'll just start rubbing it on my head. Okay. And then we could maybe stick it to the wall or something? Yeah, I think instead of a wall, we can even try on this, this whiteboard here. Oh, okay, great. Keep rubbing. I'm, I'm rubbing. Okay, ready? Yeah. Here we go. Try. And... So that, um, that didn't, didn't exactly Quite, work. Yeah. Both of us rubbing our heads on the balloon. Okay. And... Go! Wow, that was a whole lot of nothing. Well, we've got a really heavy balloon here. And so. I feel like our heads are only this big, so we can't cover as much surface area of the balloon. Fortunately, you can also build up a static charge by rubbing a balloon on a sweater. Or if your balloon is giant, rubbing sweaters on your balloon. Yeah, but even so, that really didn't good. work so well. I think what we need to do is come up with a better way to create a difference of charge. Yeah, yeah, let's forget about the balloon. You have something else? I have something else. Really awesome here at the Science Center. You want to check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all right. Should we take the sweater and the balloons, or um, should we leave them here? We'll leave them here. OK. So here's how static electricity works. Normally, everything has equal numbers of positive and negative charges. That's when things are said to have a neutral charge. But when you rub a balloon on your head, the balloon develops more negative charge than positive because it pulls electrons from your hair. The same thing happens in clouds during a storm. The cloud develops a negative charge when water molecules start bumping into each other. A lightning bolt happens when the negative charge in the cloud gets so big, the attraction to the positive charge in the ground gets strong enough that the electrons can make the jump all the way from the cloud to the ground, and you get lightning. <laughs> Heather and I tried to max out the static on a balloon, but a big heavy balloon just doesn't hold the same charge. That didn't, didn't exactly right, work. Yeah. But we're only interested in maxing out the static charge, and Heather knows just what to use. Wow. So this is the Ontario Science Center yes. electricity show. Yes. Okay, so where's the electricity part? The one we're gonna be playing with is right there. So the giant mushroom. Yeah, well, it does look like a mushroom. We're gonna make some sort of electricity salad. <laughs> All right, head on up onto that platform right oh, okay. there. And I need you to put one hand on that silver ball, yes. So the way it Nothing works. Nothing is happening. <laughs> Patience. Okay. Once I turn it on, when I engage it, this is going to steal your negative charge. So it's gonna steal your Ooh. electrons. So if it steals electrons, you're gonna be positively charged. So it'll make me more positive. Even more positive. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! I am positive! Here we go. Ooh! <laughs> this machine is called a Van de Graaff generator, and it pulls the negative charge away from the person touching Whoa. it. <laughs> That is great! Instead of having equal amounts of positive and negative charges, you become positively charged. Woohoo! Science hair! Yeah! Like when you try to put two positive ends of magnets next to each other, each hair on your head starts to repel the others and be repelled from your head. Science hair! Dude! <laughs> so your hair stands up. Ah, yes. Woohoo! I can't see anything. So this is more of a machine to generate hair standing up, but it doesn't make lightning. Oh, well, actually, I have a demonstration in my back pocket. 
This is gonna help us okay. to create lightning. This is our grounding rod. <laughs> it is my scepter of science. <laughs> and so we're gonna use this to continuously provide that negative charge. That's why static. it's plugged in. That's why it's plugged into the ground, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then if you touch it to that metal ball, got it. Uh, not too exciting, right? So pull away and let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Very good. The Van de Graaff creates a positive charge. The rod has a neutral charge. When the difference becomes big enough, the charge jumps the gap. Behold, I have the power of lightning! <laughs> so it's the difference between the positive and the negative is what we want when we want to make a lightning bolt. Yes. So is there something we can use to make that happen? Large difference of charge? Yeah, I think I have just a thing. Oh yeah? Yeah, you want to check it out? Absolutely. All right, Okay, let's, do let's it. go. So, you would like to move electricity from here to there. Well, what you need, my friend, is a conductor. All right, a little more arpeggio this time. No, not that kind of conductor. All aboard! No, not that kind of conductor either. Uh, this kind of conductor. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that's just a piece of metal. Well, that's right. That's because you're smart. This is a circuit. Electricity flows from this battery along the wires and into the light bulb. But Sal, you cleverly observe, the light bulb is not lit. This is true. That is because we have a gap in the circuit. And air is not a good conductor of electricity. Is metal a good conductor of electricity? Let us find out. <laughs> metal is a good conductor of electricity. What about wood? Nope. What about this horseshoe? Is a good conductor. Will this sandwich conduct electricity? Nope. What about this plastic fish? Nope. What about this pickle? No, pickle is not a good conductor. That's why we make electrical wires out of copper and not pickles. <laughs> you know, in case you were wondering. Lightning bolts make interesting patterns. That's because the electricity is searching for a way to get from one side to the other. But it's hard to see the patterns of lightning bolts because they happen so fast. Fortunately, using the power of science, we can observe these patterns for ourselves in a motion we can perceive. I'm going to use electricity to recreate a lightning bolt pattern. I've got two nails in a piece of wood here, and I'm gonna attach electrical leads to both nails. Now, the electricity wants to go from that side to that side, but it can't. It has to go through the wood, and wood is not a very good conductor of electricity. Now, this is very dangerous. I need a special machine even to pull this off, so this is definitely not something you want to try at home. In fact, I'm going to stand way back here when I turn it on. Like water, electricity tries to find the easiest route to get from one place to another. But sometimes that involves branching out until the right connection is made. Lightning bolts do the same thing when they branch out between the clouds and the ground. Finally, there's a spot where the branches meet and the circuit completes itself. Then the electricity follows this one path, ignoring all the others. And there you go. We just watched a lightning bolt happen in slow motion. <laughs> Science. Back to our main experiment, where Heather and I are on a quest to use static electricity to recreate a lightning bolt. Our experiments with the Van de Graaff generator had some hair-raising results, but Heather has another experiment she wants to show me. This is Jacob's ladder. Oh, so this is another way to make lightning. Yes, lightning. See, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Where do, how do we get it to go? All right. So we want to turn it on. Behold! Oh, turn it on. Not, okay. Not. Go. Oh. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> you can actually see that light climbing up between the two copper wires. That's why you call it Jacob's Ladder, because it's got the rungs of the ladder. Yeah. 
between these two points, there's a really great charge difference, right? Okay, so what's the difference? 10,000 volts, if you're looking at it. 10,000 volts, yeah. and volts is how you measure the difference in charge. Exactly. Why does it go up? So it goes up because rather than just staying at the closest point, mm -hmm. is because we're heating up the air. Oh, so, point, so yeah. hot air rises. Hot air rises. And it takes the electricity with it. So if we cooled the air, it wouldn't go up? Wouldn't immediately go up, yeah. And there it goes, and it heats back up again. Yeah. That's neat. OK, so we have a Van de Graaff generator. We got a Jacob's ladder. Are there any other devices that make lightning like this? Ooh, yeah, there's other things like the uh, Tesla coil. Really hey, high. I have a Tesla coil. You have a Tesla coil? I do. I've got one at the lab. I've just never known how to hook it up. Oh, I can help with that. Yeah. Really? Yes. OK, let's do it. Great. Let's go back to the lab. All right. um, well, should, uh, should yeah, I, no, yeah. I'll turn that off. OK. Yeah, safety first. OK. By now, you're probably an expert on what happens when you rub a balloon on your head, right? The balloon becomes negatively charged, which means it will attract anything of an opposite charge, or anything positive, or anything that is neutrally charged, like, um, well, like me. Look at the hairs on my arm when I bring the balloon close. Whoa! You see, the neutral charge in my body is being attracted to the negative charge in the balloon. So if something is negatively charged, what happens if you bring something else negatively charged nearby? Well, they'll repel each other. And here's an experiment you can do to make something fly using static electricity. You'll need a balloon, a sweater, scissors, and a plastic bag out of the thinnest plastic you can find. Fold the bag up and cut off the bottom. You don't want that part. Then cut another strip from the bag. This will give you a hoop of plastic. I find it works better if you break it and tie it again. Lie it flat and rub it with the sweater. This will give it a negative charge. You'll know you've got enough of a charge when it really wants to stick to the table. Then take your balloon and rub the sweater on the balloon to charge it up. Because both the balloon and the hoop have negative charges, they repel each other. Then put them together and it will repel. And you can get the hoop to levitate. Ha ha, a floating bag whoa, of static charge. But here's the thing, you need to keep it away from your body. Because if you get close, the bag will stick to you. Because you're neutrally charged and the bag is negatively charged. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. Ah, <laughs> maxed out floating static ring. Ha <laughs> ha! No. Yeah! Look out! Look out! Oh no! Oh, sorry about that. Uh. Oh well. It was. It was fun while it lasted. I gotta charge these up again. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Buster Beaker, and welcome to Cooking with Science. Let's say, for example, I've spilled the salt. Oh, no. Look at me. I've spilled the salt. Oh, there's salt all over the place. Not really a big deal, right? All you have to do is clean up the salt, put it back in the container. But, oh no, I've also spilled pepper on the salt. But that's all right. You might be able to carefully separate the set. But no! Oh dear, look, the pepper and the salt are all mixed together. What do I do? Well, here's how you can save the day using the power of science. All you need is a cloth and a plastic spoon. Like, like this one here. Just rub the plastic spoon on a cloth and you'll be charging it up with a negative charge of static electricity. If it's got a negative charge, it will attract anything that has a neutral charge, just like the salt and pepper. But I know what you're thinking. How will we separate them? Well, here's the answer, my friends. Pepper is lighter than salt. Observe. So if you hold the spoon high enough, the pepper will be attracted and make the jump up to the bottom of the spoon, but not the salt, as long as you've got it high enough up. Because the salt is heavier, you'd have to bring the spoon closer, which we're not going to do. And if you tap it off to the side, you'll make a nice little pile of pepper, and there you go, separating pepper from salt using the power of science. 
Thanks for watching Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. <laughs>